Hello again and welcome back or welcome to McLean Church Online. My name is Chris Norris. I'm the online site pastor. You know, I always preface that with welcome to. If this is your very first time, I want to make sure you know that you are welcome here and you, we are glad that you are here. But I also know that we have our regular attenders that are a part of our online church community. And I'm so grateful, as always, to see you guys again logging on during one of our live and interactive services on Sunday morning or even watching after the fact on YouTube. So glad you're here. Make sure you comment and say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. Well, before we get into today's service, I want to make sure that you were a part of last week's service. Pastor Brian kicked off our Advent series with a special Christmas message all about receiving the goodness of Christmas. And as Pastor Brian said, and as you are all very aware, Christmas can be a crazy time. And sometimes it doesn't feel like there's a lot of goodness happening in your life. You could have experienced grief, so Christmas is a difficult time for you. Or you could just be caught up in crazy schedules and Christmas parties and unmet expectations and all the things that bring about stress during this very sacred season as followers of Jesus. But Brian gave us five very practical steps that we can follow over the next several weeks in order to feel the goodness that Christmas brings. And I'm going to read those five to you really quick as I took some good notes last week. Number one would be think positive thoughts. Easy to say out loud, but can you do it up here, right? Number two, practice thankfulness and gratitude every day. Be thankful for at least one thing in your life. Number three, take note of divine providence. That's just a fancy church way of saying there are no coincidences. Really appreciate the moments when God intervenes. Number four, soak up the scriptures. Read your Bible. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? And number five, definitely the most important of all, stay in prayer. I'd like to go back and revisit number four and number five and tell you how my family is heeding Brian's advice and wisdom with these two. Uh, we're soaking up the scriptures at night each time we sit down for dinner. We are doing just a short Advent devotional. Now you can do this uh, either on the YouVersion Bible app on your phone or you could certainly purchase an Advent devotional book. Um, Our Daily Bread is a great option, uh, but there's certainly online resources as well to take part in doing a daily devotional. Maybe you do it at dinner with your family, maybe you do it in the morning before you head off to work. But it's a great way, especially during the Christmas season, to soak in the scriptures and be reminded of the magic and the gift and the glory that happens during this special time of year as we celebrate and await the birth of Jesus. And moving to number five, praying, right? We are being more intentional at dinner with my children and my wife in making sure that we are praying for people, people that maybe are having a difficult time at Christmas and people that are just maybe in need of some special Christmas cheer. So we are finding ways to implement Brian's very practical and helpful tips even in our daily lives, and I hope that uh, you will also do the same. And if you are, I'd love for you to comment and let me know which ones that you have already started to take part in and how it's uh, hopefully already impacting the way you're experiencing this Christmas season. And don't worry, if you didn't have a chance to write down those five steps, I would encourage you to go to our website at mcclainchurch.org, click on sermons, and re-watch last week's sermon with Pastor Brian Kelly. And on that page, there will also be a button where you can download uh, the five tips that he shared, and you can save that on your phone, print it, and put it on your refrigerator. It's just a great way that I highly recommend for you to kick off this Christmas season. And speaking of Christmas, so many great things happening, uh, both in person and online here at McLean Church, but I want to draw your attention to our website. Once again, mcleanchurch.org slash Christmas. It has our upcoming events, and most importantly, it has all of our service times and locations for our Christmas Eve celebration. We have times available right here at McLean Church Online. And of course, if you're planning on visiting in person, you can check out the website to find out which location, which day and time will work best for you and your family. We've also got a lot of other great events planned over the next several weeks, including family movie night and including some New Year's Eve celebrations as well. All that information, as always, can be available on our website at mcleanchurch.org. Go check it out. By the way, I forgot to mention, how awesome does my Christmas tree look, right? 
put a lot of work and a lot of love into this tree. So I hopefully you appreciate it being right here behind me, sufficient water, uh, beautiful sparkling colored light. I'm a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to Christmas. So I hope that you are also enjoying Christmas no matter where you are, whether you're at home in your decorated living room or on the road traveling, we're glad you're here. With all that being said, let's continue in worship today. Hello, church family. My name is Jillian, and I am so excited that you chose to worship with us today.
Last week I shared with you that I'd been reflecting more on what Advent really is, where it comes from, what it means. And I shared with you that Advent is a Latin word meaning the coming. And that the modern English definition is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. As I continued to reflect on this, it led me to think about expectations. You know, there are dangers with high expectations because a lot of times we're basically setting ourselves up for disappointment. Please take a moment now to remember a time when you set your expectations unrealistically high and they weren't met. This works the other way too. Sometimes we have low expectations and they are far exceeded. But the beauty of the gift of Jesus is that it exceeds any and all expectations no matter where they've been set.
Well, before we take a moment to give our tithes and our offerings, I want to remind you of a very special opportunity upcoming during one of our Christmas Eve services. You can have the opportunity to give toward our McLean Church Care Fund. This is an amazing resource for families, for folks who have just fallen on difficult times. Uh, and this has just been something that we've talked about year after year because it's so important to serve uh, families in our church and well beyond. Um, I have actually reached out and, and utilized this care fund for people that have crossed my path that have just needed prayer and maybe a little provision. And I'm so blessed to be able to give the love of Jesus to those folks that just needed a little bit of extra help, especially during or around or after the Christmas time. Um, it can be difficult. So if you're interested in um, giving toward the care fund, I highly, highly suggest that you pray about it and um, consider giving during that special offering uh, at Christmas Eve. Again, you can do that in person or right here online, but it's an amazing opportunity um, to tap into uh, something that God has provided us through the generosity of our church and folks like you in order to spread the love of Jesus to folks maybe in your circle. Now, let's take a moment to give back our weekly tithes and offerings. You can do that, as always, through our website at mcleanchurch.org slash give. If you're watching on a mobile device right now, pop open your phone, download the McLean Anywhere app. You can give on there. Um, no matter how you give, we are just grateful, as always, that you are deciding to commit to giving and breathing life into the mission of McLean Church. Thank you for your generosity. This year, we're finally going to get Christmas right. If it's not Jesus, it's got to go. But would that really get us to focus on the reason for the season? We might find it easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The point of Jesus' birth was to bring God into humanity. What if we were able to see Jesus in all the traditions? The first Christmas was about God with us. Let's make this Christmas about us with God. Because when we see Jesus, we are getting Christmas right. Well, hello, McLean Church Online. We are so glad that you are joining us today as we move through this Advent season. Uh, no matter where you're joining us from, you are such an important part of what we are doing here at McLean Church. We really appreciate you tuning in uh, this way each week and being a part of our online community. Uh, today we're beginning a brand new series entitled The Traditions of Christmas. Uh, this series is the third series that we've done this year on traditions. And in each of these series, is we've tried to recapture uh, the value of traditions at a moment in time when we're letting many traditions of the past go. 
Uh, this is a moment in time of unprecedented cultural change. Uh, many things that need to be let go of are being quickly dismissed. Uh, but there is a bit of a concern that in our uh, expediency to make change that sometimes we let go of or abandon uh, things that would be very valuable to hold on to. And some of the traditions, particularly traditions that have surrounded our spirituality, are probably things that are worth giving a second look to and thought about preserving them in the midst of so much change. Uh, in each of the series we've done on traditions, we've talked about the role traditions play, the power that traditions possess. And as we start this short series on the traditions of Christmas, I, I want to suggest another role or function that traditions exercise in our lives, and that is traditions uh, make mysteries uh, accessible to us. Uh, traditions make uh, mysteries understandable or accessible to us. Uh, consider um, a couple of examples. Um, we know that new life in Jesus Christ involves a, a, a fresh start, a, a wiping of the slate, a new beginning. Um, how that works and how that happens, it's, it's, it's a mystery. But we have a tradition that helps us understand it, that helps us access that mystery. And the tradition is baptism. Uh, through this ceremonial washing or immersion in water, uh, we have a tradition that helps us begin to understand and access the mystery of new life in Christ. Um, if you think about uh, the funeral traditions that, that mark our culture and that have marked human culture uh, really from the beginning of time, uh, what do those traditions do for us? They help us begin to understand and begin to process the, the, the mystery of death. Uh, the traditions give us handles to begin to understand and process mysterious realities. And a lot of the traditions that surround Christmas time uh, do exactly the same thing. They help us begin to understand in more concrete or tangible ways uh, the mystery of what occurred uh, when God entered human reality in the person of Jesus. Uh, today, we want to talk about the tradition of, of the nativity scene or the, the manger scene or the creche. Uh, we want to talk about the origins of that tradition and more importantly, we want to talk about what that tradition helps us understand or um, more fully grasp about the mystery of the Christmas moment. So uh, most of us can remember uh, playing the part of Shepherd One or Wise Man Three or the donkey uh, at the nativity uh, play uh, at Sunday school or maybe, maybe at school. Uh, most of us had grow, grew up with uh, perhaps manger scenes on our tabletops or our mantles at home. Um, all of us have seen nativity scenes uh, uh, posted in people's yards or uh, in community parks. Uh, the nativity scene that reflects or depicts the birth of Jesus is, is maybe one of the most common symbols or elements of the Christmas season. Where does this tradition of depicting the birth of Jesus in this way, where does it originate from? Well, the first thing we have to do to answer that question is we have to talk a little bit about the birth of Jesus and what we know of Jesus' birth. So, uh, what we know of Jesus' birth comes primarily to us from two gospel accounts in the New Testament. Um, you know that in the New Testament there are four biographies of Jesus. We call them Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Two of those Gospels or two of those biographies have accounts of Jesus' birth. 
Uh, those biographies would be the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospels of Luke. Um, let me read for you Luke's brief account of the birth of Jesus from chapter 1 of his Gospel. It says, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus is, is quite short. It's, it's quite brief. Uh, Matthew goes on to describe the visit of the wise men or the magi. Um, this visit, um, contrary to popular understanding, this visit happens sometime after uh, the birth of Jesus. And, and Matthew doesn't specify how many wise men there are. Uh, we speculate that there were three because three gifts are mentioned in Matthew's account. But we don't know how many there were and we don't know uh, what their names were as some medieval traditions uh, have, have recorded in them. Uh, Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus, again, it's, it, it's brief, it, it's, it's concise. It's pretty limited in its detail. Uh, Luke's account, uh, which is the more familiar account of Jesus' birth, is a bit more expansive. Uh, Luke includes the visit of the angel to Mary, as well as the shepherd's appearance at the birth of Jesus. But both of these stories, again, are relatively brief and terse in their accounting of this event. And over the years what has happened is that the two accounts, Matthew and Luke, have been joined together in most of our understandings. Uh, so we have manger scenes that depict shepherds honoring the uh, Christ child, uh, magi bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and of course the accompanying host of, of barnyard animals as we would assume would be present uh, at a manger scene. Um, a couple of interesting things to note about the biblical account of Jesus' birth. Um, we think uh, that Jesus is born not in year zero, as was at one time thought, but that uh, Jesus is likely born uh, sometime before four, the year four BCE. And we know that because Herod is alive at Jesus' birth. Remember, it's Herod uh, that asks the magi or the wise men to tell him uh, where Jesus is, where the Christ child is. Herod dies in 4 BCE, so that we know that Jesus uh, was born sometime prior to 4 BCE. Uh, many scholars think uh, perhaps actually in the year 4 BCE. We know he's born in Bethlehem. And we know he's born in a stable, although uh, there's a lot of speculation about what exactly this means. Uh, some translations translate uh, this a cave. Uh, some suggest more a barn-like structure. Uh, probably a more accurate understanding would be some portion of a home that was devoted to keeping animals. We know in the ancient Near East at this time, um, animals lived in the house uh, with people. Uh, what was often considered a means uh, for providing heat and warmth uh, in the home. Uh, they would be in a separate section, often downstairs or to the end of a house. 
and, and some scholars speculate uh, that the, the manger scene would have been in that portion uh, of, of a residence. Uh, you can uh, look into all that at your own leisure and convenience. Uh, the bottom line is we don't know exactly what the manger scene looks like probably pretty sure it doesn't look like the romanticized versions that some of our manger sets depict, but that's quite okay. Because here's what we know about God. God is always inviting us to understand him in our context and from our perspective. So as we're going to see in just a moment, uh, over the years, the manger scene has been embellished um, uh, uh, quite a bit, probably, from the actual biblical account of Jesus' birth. But that embellishment, that's not a bad thing. That actually serves an important purpose in helping us better understand God in our own terms. So uh, don't be concerned if your manger set has shepherds and wise men, uh, even though in the biblical account, it was only the shepherds that appeared at the moment Jesus was born. So how did this whole tradition or practice of depicting the birth of Jesus in these model-like forms, how did it originate? Well, we have examples um, throughout history from about uh, the fourth century on of, of artists depicting uh, the birth of Jesus in images, in um, uh, 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 paintings and reliefs uh, that would model uh, something similar to what our nativity scenes show or portray. But it's really St. Francis in the 13th century, the year 1223 to be exact, that's uh, credited with creating the first nativity scene. And as history and tradition records it, uh, St. Francis, uh, serving as a priest in a town in Italy, uh, created the first manger scene outside of his church to help his people uh, who, who, who couldn't read, who couldn't read the gospel accounts of Jesus' birth, understand exactly what took place on that first Christmas. Um, it's, it's reported and speculated uh, that St. Francis created somewhat of a, a living nativity scene outside of his church, uh, using people to play the role of the principal characters, Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, uh, perhaps using live animals uh, to create the, the manger-like setting. Francis sees an opportunity to communicate to people who again could not read the gospel accounts for themselves of the birth of Jesus, could depict for them what that birth really embodied. And we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. From, from this early practice of St. Francis in the 13th century, the idea starts to catch on throughout medieval Europe. And we begin to have the development of, of the Christmas play or the Christmas pageant. Yeah, that Sunday school play that you were in when you were five years old. It probably has its origins in medieval Europe as, as other churches, as other groups see the power and value in acting out the Christmas story for people, again, who, who largely could not read and did not have the biblical record available to them to portray to them what had actually happened on that first Christmas. Uh, this movement move, takes us right up into to, to the Victorian era, 19th century. In both Europe and America, we begin to have the development of, of, of the manger scenes, of the nativity sets, uh, like you may have in your home today. In fact, uh, some of us might actually possess some of those early nativity sets uh, from the 19th century, very, very valuable and very precious indeed. And, and this took us right down into the modern day where still, I'm guessing many of us have, have pulled out manger scenes 
uh, and are certainly looking at major scenes as we drive around and see displays in people's yard or even um, I, I was out and about uh, last weekend and saw, saw, saw one on a town square. Um, this tradition uh, goes back to Francis in the 13th century, creating a model for people to understand how Christ came into the world. The nativity scenes that we see, the manger sets that we have in our homes, they continue to function as a powerful reminder of how Christ entered our world and of what the how means to us in the present moment. Think about three things that the manger scene, the nativity set, the nativity play that we might see at this time of year reminds us of or reveals to us. The first is it reminds us that Christ shows up in the ordinary. Christ shows up in the ordinary. It's not in the spectacular that Christ comes to the earth. It, it, it's in the common. It's in the ordinary. In, in the first century ancient Near East, you don't get any more ordinary or common uh, than a peasant girl giving birth to the Christ child in, in a stable uh, surrounded by shepherds who come to acknowledge and adore the Christ, it doesn't get more ordinary than that. Christ is always showing up. Christ is always making himself known. Christ is always revealing himself in the ordinary. It's in the shopping trip to Walmart. It's taking the kids in the morning to preschool. It's getting dinner together for the family on a Wednesday night. It's in the ordinary, the common, the routine that Christ makes himself known if we are attuned to watch for him. It's not in the cathedral that Christ is found. It's in the ordinary, everyday, mundane experience of our lives that Christ reveals himself if we enter the common and the ordinary with an awareness that Christ is there. Our everyday life is an invitation to see Christ present and at work as we talked last week when we talked about being aware of divine providence. It's in the ordinary that Christ is revealed. And yes, Christ is present in the cathedral too. but he is more frequently accessed and made known in the common, ordinary, everyday existence of our lives if we are willing to look for him. Secondly, Christ is found in creation. Fascinating that Christ shares his birthplace with the animals. Again, in the first century, you don't get much greater connection to creation than would be found in a stable. And this becomes the place in which Christ is made known to humanity. Christ revealed in creation. What, what does this mean for us? Well, what, what means at least two very practical things. 
number one, people, people of faith ought, ought, ought to be the greatest and best stewards of creation in all of the world. And, and I know, sadly, um, you know, um, environmental concerns have, have been all too politicized uh, by both sides of the political aisle. I, I'm not talking about the politici- politicalization of environmental ideals here. I'm talking about the responsibility and appreciation that followers of Jesus Christ have for the creation order because Christ reveals himself in and through God's creation. That's how he comes to earth. And if followers of Christ ought to be the best stewards of the creation order there is, they also ought to be people who are engaging with the creation to see and discover Christ there. This is a real practical encouragement uh, for you to get outside this time of year. Uh, Whether you live in the country or in an urban setting or in the suburbs, this is a time in which we are invited to appreciate the creation order because Christ shows up there if we're taking time to pay attention and if we have eyes to see his reality. It's in appreciating the the beautiful winter sunsets or uh, here in northwestern Pennsylvania, uh, the, uh, the beauty of new fallen snow on, on the ground, uh, that, that we begin to open ourselves up to how Christ is presenting himself, revealing himself through the creation order. Uh, so um, get outside a little bit with your kids. Uh, maybe maybe buy, yourself, uh, buy your kids a, a telescope set instead of a video game uh, for Christmas so they can begin to see the wonder of creation in the universe. Appreciate the fact that Christ shows up in the midst of his creation at the first Christmas and continuing on into today. Third, Christ shows up in the chaos. You don't get much more chaotic um, than a young unwed couple uh, having to find a place to give birth in a town where there is no room available for them in the inn. The, the, The chaos, the crisis that surrounds the birth of Jesus Um, it's significant. And yet it's right in the middle of the chaos, the crisis, the imperfection, that, 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 that Jesus is revealed, that the Christ is found. This is such an important message for us to hear because there's so much pressure in our current culture to get it right, to have it perfect. Uh, especially if you're uh, a young parent, uh, you know the pressure you feel to make the experience just right for your children. I was recently talking to a parent who was uh, sharing with me all the things uh, that they had planned for their child this Christmas season uh, to make it spectacular. And as I heard everything that was planned, I thought, oh my It's way more than is needed because Christ is found in the imperfect. Christ is found in the chaos. So can I give you permission uh, just to not have it perfect? Uh, What your children need is not, not the perfect Christmas tree or just not the precise number of gifts or not six different breakfasts with Santa. Uh, What they need is they need your love. Um, They need your attention and they need your joy. 
they need your happiness at this time of year. Uh, that will do more to reveal the reality of Christ in this season uh, than all the special events you could plan or everything you do to try to make this season just right. Christ shows up in the chaos. He shows up in the imperfection if we again have the eyes to see his presence. When Christ shows up, Christ shows up with goodness, with joy, with peace. When we see Christ in the common, in creation, in the chaos, what we see is the goodness, the joy, the peace that transcends our circumstances, that is not dependent on having just the right Christmas tree, that does not require every relationship in our life to be in perfect order. Because the goodness, the joy, the peace of Christ transcends that. Let me challenge you over the next few weeks. Um, if you have a manger scene, a nativity set, when you look at it, think about these truths. Christ shows up in the common. Christ shows up in creation. Christ shows up in the chaos. If you don't have a nativity set, maybe this is a year to get one. And let this tradition remind you of the presence of Christ and where that presence is found as we engage in all the joy, all the goodness, and all the peace that is ours this Christmas season. During the Advent season, we celebrate joy. One definition of joy is a lasting feeling of great pleasure or elation caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. We read about joy in the Bible in Luke 2, where an angel speaks to terrified shepherds in a field and says, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Father, thank you for the joy that you brought to the world in Jesus Christ. Because of this gift, like the shepherds in the fields, we can replace our fears with joy. As we celebrate Advent, may our hearts be filled with the good news that was the birth of a Savior to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king of
tell it, go, go tell it, go 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 tell it, go, go tell it, Well, that concludes our services for today. I'm so glad that you decided to be here. I hope that you already are marking your calendars about our Christmas Eve services that are sneaking up on us, right? We are just about two weeks away from Christmas. Kind of crazy to think about, but it's coming and we are so excited that we get to celebrate the birth of Jesus with you right here in McLean Church Online or at any of our physical locations. Please stay connected with us throughout the week. Uh, please stay tuned for updates and information about ways that you can get involved with the mission of McLean Church. And we're just so excited to be able to be with you here online. And I hope to see you back here next week here at McLean Church Online.